This is the first of two videos created to talk about the boilers and boiler rooms on Battleship Texas. We'll tour a boiler in this one to show you some of its details and how it worked. A future video will walk through its room to show the incredible complexity of the piping, valves, and pumps required to make things happen. Before we start, I want to thank a true gentleman, Tom Gillette. Tom is a retired marine engineer, steam systems expert, and decades-long volunteer on board Battleship Texas. During that time, he has generously shared his knowledge with thousands of volunteers and visitors. This gracious support was used in much of what follows. If you watched the fuel system video, you will know that the oil-fired boilers that we will be looking at were installed on Texas during a 1925 through 1926 refit as replacements for the original coal-fired boilers. They were designed by Captain C.W. Dyson specifically for use in large high-speed capital ships. The ones now on Texas were originally meant for use on battleship South Dakota, but were repurposed when that ship was scrapped to meet the requirements of the Washington Naval Arms Limitation Treaty of 1922. Here is an excellent cutaway illustration of one from a 1922 technical journal. Oddly, its scale is wrong. When compared to the man standing at the lower left corner of the boiler, the boiler appears to be almost twice as large as it is in real life. The boilers on Texas are referred to as A-type, three-drum, small water tube express boilers. Looking at a representation of them, you can see that their overall shape forms an A. There are three drums on it, a steam drum at the top and two water drums, one on each side at the bottom. Connecting the water drums to the steam drum are 2,854 small diameter steel water tubes. It is called an express boiler because of its ability to quickly produce large amounts of steam. This is because the large number of small tubes creates a tremendous amount of tube wall surface area. As surface area increases, more water in the tubes is exposed to the heat, meaning that it will heat faster. In this design, the surface area of the tubes created a total steam generating surface of more than 6,000 square feet. To put that into perspective, this equals the square footage of three moderately sized houses in a single boiler. With that much area, a boiler already at operating temperature will respond almost instantly with more steam as additional burners are lit. Dyson boilers were designed for use in turbine driven ships, so they were equipped with superheaters to put extra heat and energy into the steam. This was done by passing freshly generated steam through an additional set of tubes nested just above the generating tubes to add more heat. While this is very efficient, it also makes the steam extremely dry. That works well in turbines, but it is not at all good in reciprocating engines like those on Texas. Those engines must use cooler, wetter, saturated steam so that some water will condense on cylinder walls to act as a lubricant. Superheated steam will not do that. Oil could not be used to lubricate cylinders because it would get into the steam and ultimately into the feed water where it could coat the inside of boiler tubes. That would reduce their efficiency and lead to hot spots that could make them fail. Since they couldn't be used in Texas, superheaters were removed before the boilers were installed, which opened up more space for some particularly useful equipment that will be discussed in the video tour. This is an oil-fired small water tube boiler uh, built by Bureau Express. It uh, can obviously in the black portion here has a firebox where there are eight burners mounted. Uh, these burners were made by a manufacturer called Kayama. On the outside in these silver sections are where the uh, boiler tubes are located. The water would circulate down through the outer banks of tubes and then exhaust the heat from the firebox passing over the the first two or three rows of them generated steam in what were called the generating tubes. Because of the pressure, the temperature differential as the heat moved across these tubes, a natural convection was set up. Steam would rise and boil up into the steam drum at the top, and then water would circulate down through the outer ones into the water drums. There were water drums located on each side. Now, right now, we can't see into the water drums because they've got these brackets and rods attached to them that extend up through into the uh, drying room and uh, they're using these to support some of the weight of the boilers off the frame of the ship. This uh, not only takes weight off of a, of a part of the frame that they're a little bit concerned about, but by leaving some of the weight on it, that actually helps support or brace the frame when the ship is towed. Now let's take a look into the firebox. 
we'll disconnect our light, put it down. There we go. Inside the firebox, the lower portions on the sides and the back are lined with fire brick which could resist the more than 2,000 degree temperatures generated inside this room. On the outer sides, we can see the, the, out, the inner rows of tubes. These are sets of the generating tubes. So the heat generated inside this firebox would move up through the tubes on both sides and then up and out the outtakes, or uptakes rather, and into the uh, smoke stack. Now these, uh, you can see that We've left four of the, uh, or, sorry, three of the burners off, and you can see that there's these little fins on them. Let's, that's important to note because when we look at one of the uh, burners, we can see some of its construction details. The burner consists of the uh, the actual burner tube here that, once removed has a small orifice or tip on it. Now that tip has a disc inside of there that as oil was pushed through under a very high pressure, the disc would spin. And as it spun, it would, uh, it would uh, atomize the oil and create a very fine and even mist. Air moving through the dampers on the outer burner unit would, uh, would move through there. And if you look closely, you can see some fins up in there. Those are the fans that we see here. So the fuel would be spinning one way as it enters the firebox and the air would swirl the other way. And that would create a very, very even mix. And this was important because any droplets of oil other than the very fine uh, combined mist would create smoke. Didn't matter what you did, it would create smoke. Now the way this worked is that they could fire up any number of burners they wanted depending upon the steaming rate they wanted out of the boiler. Now what they did, so to cut a boiler in, you'd open up this valve here. This is a fuel rail. Uh, fuel oil that's heated to 250 degrees would circulate uh, through this rail and it would actually circulate through and back out and return the unused fuel would return to the tanks. You wouldn't try to adjust fuel flow here. That would make an almost impossible situation. So you would open the valve all of the way, and you would open the damper. Whenever a, a, a burner is not being used, the air damper would be fully closed because if you didn't, it would suck fresh air, cold air, into that firebox, and it would cool down your fire, and you'd lose tremendous efficiency. So you'd open up the valve, fuel valve, the fuel, if, it burn, if there are burners already burning there, would immediately ignite. Then you would unlock and open this register here. And they could actually watch through periscope up here, and they would look for smoke. And they would see smoke. So then, when, as they watched, this damper would be closed down until the smoke disappeared, and then they would lock it into place. And that's and uh, so they, based, since there were eight burners here, there were eight, basically eight levels of steaming rate that they could accomplish. Now, one thing that we know from uh, from memos was that the outer burners on the bottom, on the left and right, they tried not to run those at full blast because there would be these jets of just white hot flames coming off the ends of those burners. And if those flames impinged or hit that fire brick, it would erode the fire brick. And those were the two burners that uh, could create that problem. Now, after a while, because of the intense heats um, involved, uh, fuel would carbonize on the tips of, the, uh, of those burners. So they had to periodically shut burners off. They would uh, come over and switch them out for some that are here in storage. And then they could uh, clean that burner tip. And the way they would do that is they would take that burner and set it in a jig. They'd unscrew the cap, remove the little disc, clean out the orifices, screw the cap back on, and then it could go back into storage. Now, they would obviously have to wait till that burner tip uh, cooled down because it uh, would be exceptionally hot. Now, 
because we've got these support pieces in the uh, water drums, we can't really show that in de we can't show the inside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the uh, video here, and I'll go to some stills that I have, and I will give you descriptions from there. A look into the left-hand water drum allows us to see its most important details. On the left is a doubler plate installed to allow the use of a butt joint and four rows of rivets to hold the water tube together. Special chisels were used to hammer metal around the edges of each rivet head and along the edges of the doubler plate into the surface they made against. This is how they were caulked to seal the drum so that it would not leak while containing high pressure steam. You can also see the bottom ends of more than a thousand water tubes on the upper right part of the drum. These were inserted, then attached and sealed to the drum using an expander that enlarged and crimped their ends against the drum. Now, these gauges to operate this boiler were very simple. There are really only two gauges. We have pressure gauge and we have temperature gauges. This showed the pressure and the temperature of the steam. And there was, each gauge had a second one, a backup. So there's two pressure and two temperature gauges because being analog dials, you might have one fail. And if you only had one gauge, you wouldn't necessarily know it. and You could get in trouble real fast. So we had two. These red and green wheels here would actually allow them to open and close the water valves that put poured water into the steam drum, which I'll talk about here in just a little bit. But that was also typically done from above. Now, one other thing we want to discuss briefly is that when these uh, boilers uh, were built, they were actually built for a, a later class ship that uh, the construction was discontinued due to the uh, Washington Naval Arms Limitation Treaty of 1922. Well, since those ships had turbines uh, power instead of the big reciprocating steam engines, they also had superheat. Superheat heated the steam in a an additional step and was a very valuable thing to have for turbines, but you can't use that on, uh, on a reciprocating steam engine. You have to have what's called saturated steam, which isn't heated really any more, any higher than its vapor point. The reason for that is that the cylinder walls and, and, and piston rings were lubricated by condensate from the steam. So it, they were actually lubricated by water. You could not use oil because the oil would get in the steam and would poison your, uh, your feed water. So, the, uh, when these were installed in the ship, they removed the superheaters from them, and they instead what they did was they put out steaming outlines that allowed them to create soot blowers. Now, soot will accumulate on the outside of those boiler tubes, and that cuts down on their heat carrying efficiency, and so you occasionally wanted to clean them. So what they could do is this is a steam pipe here. They would, uh, they would use this valve handle, they would open the valve and that would blow live steam through a uh, tube that uh, the end of it's coming out of the housing there and that tube had perforations. Using this chain, they could rotate that tube and what that would do is that would sweep the live steam across the tubes like that and that would blow the soot up and out the stack. So you either did that at sea or you did it in the middle of the night when you were in harbor because you didn't want people seeing you do that because that soot would end up covering not only your ship but all your other ships around you. Okay, I am now on a catwalk that's up at the top of the boiler. From here we can see the steam drum, which we'll talk about in just a second. Off of that come the two outputs, steam outputs, and there are two in case there's a valve or pipe failure. They can close one off and then feed the other one uh, alone, or both of them, into the steam main, which is this very large pipe at the top. These connect through those cross connect valves that I showed you out in the ammo passage. In fact, there's a, a cutoff valve there that's fed, that's actuated by that uh, handle or stem that I showed you down at the bottom of the ladder room. So let's turn back around. There's a curved section like this on each side. This is where the exhaust comes up after it's crossed over the boiler tubes and it enters a single, on each side enters into a single uptake and that goes up into the drying room is one of the two that we saw up there. 
But here's where the real action is. This is called the steam drum. First of all, this is where water's pumped in at 400 pounds per square inch. And as you can see, there are two separate uh, valves and inputs. Again, this is for redundancy and safety's sake. If you have a problem with one, you always have another way of feeding it. There's also two sight glasses. There's one here that could be used to look at the water level inside this steam drum. And then there was one here that has been removed. This way, if one was clogged, you'd certainly get a false reading. So you'd constantly check both of them to make certain that uh, of your water level. The key here is this uh, steam drum ideally would be kept half full at all times. If you uh, filled it too high, you'd get what's called priming, which is water would splash up into the dry tube, which is the intake for the steam, and you get water in your steam, which is a really bad thing. If you let it run too low, then you might uncover a boiler tube. And without water in them, that 2,000 degree heat in the firebox would quickly destroy the tube, and then you would have a major leak. Now let's get a closer look inside the drum, because there's several things to look at in there. First of all, if you look over here on the sides, you can see that there are rows of rivets. There's a doubler plate, and there's another set here. So these were actually fabricated out of two pieces. Now below those are the uh, top ends of the boiler tubes, and you can see there's literally thousands of them. What you can, all you can see here are the smaller ones where the cooler water circulated back down to the water drums. The generating tubes are underneath this kind of V-shaped tray, and if you look closely, you'll see that it has thousands of perforations in it. Now the reason that is there is because uh, steam bur bubbling out of those generating tubes would blast water along with it. And again, you don't want water spraying up into the top of the steam drum. So that those perforations would stop the splashing but allow steam to come up through them. And they would go into what's called the dry pipe, which is this tube or pipe that runs along. Let's see, sorry about this. Let me, let me get my light up in there better. There we go, oh, too much light. But you can see that pipe that runs the length of it. There are holes drilled along the top of it, and that's where the steam pushed in to enter the, uh, the steam pipes. And so between that tr perforated tray and the holes being drilled on the top, you got very little, if any, water into the steam system. So that's the, that's the way that worked. Now there's one other thing that I want to show you. Um, Steam-operated items, uh, especially the engines, if they were shut off quickly, that would cause an instant jump in steam pressure. And the steam, these uh, boilers were good for up to 300 PSI, or pounds per square inch. You could jump over that very quickly. So on the back, is we have a total of four pressure valves. These valves would be, could be set in stages, and one of them could be used as what's called a sentinel valve. And what that would do is it would pop off, you'd hear the steams roaring through it, and you'd know that it's time to be better back off on the fire on the boiler and drop the pressure. But if that pressure continued to build, it would uh, then, they would continue to open until they were all open and taking pressure off the boiler. Now you didn't just let that steam rush out because it's at about 420 degrees temperature. So it piped out and it actually fed up into one of the exhaust out, uh, uptakes and out the uh, smokestack if that was a, an issue. You can also see that there are cables and pulleys. This al allowed someone from below, if they detected a situation that required immediate shut uh, depressurizing the boiler, from below, they could grab those handles and manually open those valves. From here, you can see just a mass of pipes. Now, what these pipes did, I already described the two coming off the steam drum and going to the main, but this is a cross-connect pipe. This connected the two boilers together, and with this, they could run the two boilers together, they could feed the steam mains that run along each side of the boiler rooms and down to each side of the uh, two engine rooms. 
They could separate, they could uh, shut off one, uh, one of these valves here, like this, and they could disconnect that cross main to where now you could, if you did it on all three, you'd run only the boilers on the three boilers and three boiler rooms on the starboard side to run the starboard engine or the three boilers on the port side to run the port engine. This was the common setting when they were at battle stations. They actually ran a split system and split the two engines so that if they had a major casualty, they would still have half, half their power regardless. 600 pound boilers became possible once the Navy approved the use of welding for pressure vessels. While this greatly increased output and efficiency, it also forced changes to boiler design. Increased steaming rates at 600 pounds disrupted the convection current in water tubes and could starve them of water, so downcomers that were separate from the tubes were added to independently pipe water to the drums. Boilers also gained outer jackets that allowed pressurized combustion air to be pumped between them and the boiler. This preheated the air going to the burners using the boiler's own heat. It also eliminated the prior practice of pressurizing the entire boiler room to provide positive air pressure to the boilers. These and other advances resulted in greater efficiency and higher capacities needed to feed the powerful turbines used to propel ships built just before and during World War II. This boiler on Battleship Alabama not only produced much more steam than those on Texas, it is smaller and can be operated in an unpressurized boiler room immediately adjacent to the turbine that it feeds. Even though they were obsolete in comparison to newer units, Dyson design boilers continued to be used on the older dreadnought ships. They worked beautifully on Texas and were an excellent fit with the ship's existing layout and systems. Throughout World War II, the boilers performed well, were extremely durable, and fully proved their value. Most importantly, the six units were cleaner, easier to operate, and provided much more steam than the original 14 coal-fired boilers. Their greater capacity ultimately gave the ship what she needed to meet increasing power demands throughout the remainder of her career.